Today, today is June 1st, 2015, and we are interviewing Dr. Gerhard Malishek. Malishek. Malishek at the Centralia Public Library. The doctor, Dr. Malishek, is 82 years old. 80. 83 three. years old, and was born in Czechoslovakia. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be the interviewer. Doctor, for the record, I would like to ask you, when, how old were you when you first joined the Army, and which Army did you have to join? Well, uh, first, I didn't have to join the Army. We were in 1944, that's after Stalingrad, after the Germans lost Stalingrad, which <coughs> indicated the war is going bad for the Germans. We were <coughs> seventh and eighth grade students in our area were called to dig fortifications during the summer. Now that means with shovel, the machinery was not there. The, the, the military had all the machinery, it was all by hand. <coughs> now at the end of, in September of 1944, when school started, we were sent back home to, to go to school. 1940, 40, uh, 45, 44, that was, that was 1943. 1944, again we were called in for the summer to dig fortifications all through Germany on the, on the, cor on the borders, uh, uh, bordering Poland, because that's where the Russian army was coming through. And in, 19, in se well, September came and we were not sent back. Now the, the Russian army was uh, in Germany already, the eastern part of Germany, and we were made, for, uh, we were uh, uh, integrated into the local militia, it, it was called Volkssturm. Now uh, we were, that was a military unit but we had old uniforms, you know, discarded German uniforms, and all we had is rifles, and, and we were trained how to shoot bazookas because the Russians used a lot of tanks. So uh, there were some people that were older in, in, that, in that group that was called in to uh, build the fortifications. And the army, try, the German army, try, now the uh, Volkssturm was like our National Guard. It was, it, it was army, but it was, you know, National Guard is army, but it's uh, regulated locally. So uh, recruiters recruited people in our group. Well, of course, I was young. I was, in 1944, I was 13 years old little 13 and a half, but it, it enticed me because they were recruiting for tank troops, dri driving uh, uh, armored, uh, for armored units. So I, uh, I understand that uh, the ones that they recruit, the younger ones will become tank drivers. Well, I couldn't ride a, drive a car or I couldn't ride a motorcycle, but I was enticed to drive a tank. So. I, I talked to the recruiter and he says, you're too young to uh, be integrated. So he changed my birth year. And I think it was 17 or so that, that he made me. And I went through uh, uh, tank training. And of course it was all condensed, you know, it wasn't a long drawn out affair. And I was assigned to a tank unit, driving, driving the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, 14 years, 13 years old, 14 years old, what, what else can you expect a young man wanting to do, you know? 
Did you have any um, of your? Uh, did you have any brothers that joined the military? No, or? they were young. My brother was younger than I was. Okay. So that was how I got in the German army. Mm -hmm. Now, 1945, 1944, in, around Christmas, I can't remember the date. <coughs> we were standing in a village, and our tanks. There were French tanks that were, you know, from little little tin boxes in comparison to the, what the German army had. But so our positions were always blocking, it hold, slowing down the enemy. Slow, and in a tank, <coughs> you have an escape hatch for the driver that he can, if he gets, because the tanks burn quite a bit. You have oil. But it wasn't this uh, the case. We didn't have oil in our tank. We had about 40 liters of of gasoline in the tank. But we were driving by wood. We had a wood burner on the outside of the tank, mm -hmm. and you had to saw by hand uh, and burn. But anyway, the t uh, and you were not supposed to keep that hatch open, but we all did because if, if the tank got hit, we wanted to get out real fast. So that's, I drove, I must have driven over a mine or a, or a hand grenade, and I got hurt on my right foot quite a bit. And in January, I got the same thing. I was in a village, I got hurt on my left leg from a shrapnel. And then in April of 1945, we were captured by the Russians. And from Poland all the way to Russia, we marched three months. My legs were hurting me. They were not healed, and but I must have been in good shape because I lived through it. So then, the International Red Cross in 1946, I think it was, came and inspected, you know, because the Allies, again, is it going to be recorded? Uh, General Patton wanted to go against Russia, you know, I don't know, are you familiar with it? And the U.S. government says no. But <clears throat> so the thing came that the German prisoners are being mistreated. So the International Red Cross came in to the prisoner of war camps and inspected. And of course, everything was okay. But that lady that took care of my wounds gave me, gave me bandages and stuff like that. I don't know if she was a physician or a nurse. Russian lady, young, I, I can't tell how old she was, <coughs> but I spoke Czech, you know, because I, I, I went through Czech schools too, and Russian is a Slavic language, same way as Czech, it's just the, the written part is different, it's serial. Uh, so she sort of had a liking for me. And when the Red Cross came, she made them aware of my problems. And the Red Cross slated me to go to, uh, f for help. And it happened to be Scotland, England, that uh, I was shipped out. Now, I can't remember how I got there, but I think it was on, on, a, tra on a train. See, Russia, the occupation troops in Germany, they were dismantling all the industry in Russia, in Germany, and transported it to Russia. The trains were functioning. The German trains were functioning, and of course the Russian trains were functioning. functioning. Prisoner, Russian, former Russian prisoner of war in, the German, in Germany were transported to Russia by train. So I don't know if I came back on a train. I can't, it's vague. Must have, must have been mentally that I was. 
Uh, so I, I ended up in uh, Scotland, Glasgow, Scotland. And after I, I healed real fast because they shipped me back to Germany. And in Germany, the American government was sending their German prisoners, or some of them, to Russia to help building up what the Germans destroyed. Well, I was in one of those camps, but before Christmas of 1946, uh, uh, Truman, who was the president at that time, had a feud with Stalin, and so Truman stopped the shipment. And in January of 47, we were discharged from the American prisoner of war camp. That's, and that's when I went. You see, I could have, if I had, if I if were thinking like I think, think now, in, in Russia, if you were born in Germany, you're a German. If you were born in Czechoslovakia, you're a Czech. If you were born in Poland, you're a, you're a Pole, you know. But that was, I was born in Czechoslovakia, but I was German. German parents that came from Germany because there was a lot of work in Czechoslovakia, but very little in Germany after the First World War, you see. So I don't know what year, uh, 20, 1924, 1925, my dad and mom moved to Czechoslovakia. So the Russians sort of looked upon me as a Czech, and maybe I had a little uh, better, not better treatment, but they were not beating me or, ki or kicking me or, or stuff like that. <coughs> but I insisted that I was not Czech, I was German. So uh, they kept me, otherwise I probably would have been discharged from the prisoner war camp in Russia as a Czech, but I said, I'm not a Czech, I'm German. So that's how I ended up in Germany. Now, when, um, after you were released uh -huh. and you ended up in Germany, uh -huh. Why did you go to Germany instead of going back to Czech? Well, I went to, oh, uh, because Czechoslovakia was my home. I didn't think they were, they were going to be that bad. Finesse, some, not all Czechs, not our neighbors or so, but people just like Chesterfield in Missouri. People in Chesterfield did not riot or burned or looted. There were people from New York and this, they, they were paid to go to Chesterfield and riot. Well, that was the same way in Czechoslovakia. Didn't they? We, I, I can go now uh, and talk to my neighbors, my, the ones that I went to school with and all this and, you know. Uh, so anyway, I went home. But then when I got home, my mom wasn't there. My brothers weren't there, but I was already registered and registered for military service because now uh, my, uh, the date that I, the German recruiter changed, that was my birthday date, but I, that wasn't my real birthday. And the Czech, uh, use were used by the Russians to drive cattle to Ch to Russia by on the road. You see, so I skipped. I went over to Germany, East Germany, and from East Germany to, and I came to West Germany, and of course, the I had, by then I had an ID card uh, uh, where I came from. You know. And if you had that card, you could ride all the trains for nothing. 
So I bummed around for, I don't know for how many months, uh, in the cattle cars or, or whatever. Didn't cost me anything. And every place you went, you could get a seven-day ration card because Germany was rationed. And so I had plenty to eat, yeah, because, but I didn't have the money. So I think sometimes I worked. Now, I can't recall any, in a far, in a farm, on the farms, that was, because factories were not working yet. Volkswagen was the only factory that was in, uh, started to build cars for the American soldiers, you know. Two hundred dollars for a Volkswagen, uh, but I worked on a on a farm milking cows or uh, looking for mines in the field because some of the fields were mined by the Germans, you know, or by the Allies, and that's how I got. Well, when I had enough money, I went back on the train and bummed around. But every station now the Red Cross, the uh, German Red Cross and the International Red Cross were good. On every railroad station there were plaques with names of people that were looking for other people. And that's how I found where my mom was. And she was close to Stuttgart, Germany. So. And that's when you, when you saw your mom's name is yeah. when you went to to connect with her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the only way. You see. Mm -hmm. And with your mom, who else was living there? My brother, and my younger sister. My older sister was just like me, uh, uh, recruited for uh, war efforts. She was a nurse helper. You know, in, in, it was a f German army hospital. And she, she was not, she was not uh, home uh, uh, the latter part of the war. I, well, mine was September, and I don't, she was ahead of me because she was a year older then. Uh, but then we, she found us too then, you see, like I did for, through the thing. And I, we went to Stuttgart now. Stuttgart was quite a ways Away, uh, seven or eight miles, uh, kilometers, but w I probably went to Stuttgart every week at least once to look for my our sister uh, through these uh, searching agencies, the Red Cross. It was international and German Red Cross. The German Red Cross was uh, really good. Yeah, there were people that were dedicated a lot of uh, older people that because the young people were in the service women uh, girls or boys so it was old people that uh, and they were dedicated they helped you they uh, they even had soup sometimes some days you know or, at n or some nights I think it was and you got a plate and got some soup and, <clears throat> no, <clears throat> did all of your family go to Germany, or did some of them stay in Czechoslovakia? No, <coughs> just my mom. She didn't go to Germany. She didn't. She was thrown out of Czechoslovakia and uh, was shipped to Germany. And again, I can't remember how she got shipped. <coughs> my mom, my brother, and my sister, the youngest one. My dad was still a prisoner in Russia, I think, or whatever country he was in. I can't remember anymore. And German prisoners were still coming back in 1970. Old men and de decrepit, you know, because uh, if you were in camp and you worked on a farm, or building whatever G German army destroyed, Russian people are good people. They fed you whatever they could, whatever they grew, potatoes, uh, uh, beets, and stuff like that, when you worked. 
So not all. My dad was well. He was sick. He was. He, uh, he came back in 1969, 68 or 69, and that's when I went to Czechoslovakia from Irvington in 1970, 1971, 70, 71. My sister, who was in in Baltimore or no, Florida, she was first. She went to Czechoslovakia, and when she came back, she said, you better go, because Dad doesn't look good. So I went uh, right after reserve duty in summer camp, I went to it by myself. And my brother was in Germany, of course. He had a car, so we drove to Czechoslovakia, through Austria to Czechoslovakia. And uh, again, we encountered, that was still, the, the Russian army was still there, you see. But they were sort of withdrawn in a forest. They weren't in the open anymore. But they were still there. On the border, it took a whole day to get cleared. And uh, th they had a lot of information about me. On, they had black books. And if you were born in a d uh, given uh, county, they had my name was there, and some sar sar sarcastic questions uh, you know, was asked is, so you you don't like Czechoslovakia? You had to go to America, huh? You see, but I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't chased out of Czechoslovakia. That was not recorded. I I don't know uh, what they had, what or what they thought they had is. They had me when I went into Czechoslovakia after I got out of prison, but they didn't have me escaping Czechoslovakia, you see. But then they knew I was in, I had an American passport, so they knew I was in America, so they said I must have left, you know, so anyway. Did you feel, going back, the first time you went back to Czechoslovakia, uh -huh. Was there a little bit of... Uh, Apprehension? Yes. Oh, yes. The only reason I got is... See, I haven't seen my dad since 1942 or 43. So I was anxious to see him, you see. Now, my aunts, they're all in, they were not thrown uh, out of... Uh, they lived in a different section of, of, of that Selvia, of that, of that province, about 10, 10 miles away from us. And they were, the whole, the whole town was German. Now our town, our village was half Czech or more than half Czech uh, and maybe one third German. So those, of course, what the, what the Czechs wanted is first of all to satisfy Stalin, you know, tell him how bad it is, but they got their property. You see, uh, our house, my grandma's house, gone. The Czechs lived there. So anyway, it was it was bad, but I, oh, I, I I had apprehensions, yes, but the drive to see my dad was there. Now. In 1976, I took my wife and the children, and we went. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, in 1976, you know, before that, I had my dad come to America. You see, to visit with my older, with my one of the sisters. Uh, and he stayed for, and then he w visited with my sister, and then he went back to, but we had to put deposit money to make sure that he's coming back. But anyway, the village that we were in, lived in, we were all neighbors, and uh, one of the neighbors had a boy, I forgot how old. He was probably my sister's age. And the other neighbor right across the street had grown up children, you see. So uh, they had apple trees in the yard. 
And when you were by, he says, here, you want an apple? You know, we had cherry, so I would bring them cherries. We had cherry trees around the house, you know. So, uh, but the Czechs misbehaved after the war. They, they were, you could see, oh, uh, uh, how, uh, how they treated some, some of those Germans. I don't know, my mom didn't complain that she was mistreated or so, but... So you went back twice? To Czechoslovakia, yeah, yeah or, uh, two or three times already, yeah. Now we're getting old. Yeah, my, my wife is 80, I'm 83, and uh, this flying is it's just too strenuous. Now we went to Germany uh, two times or three times, too, because two with my brother. Well, my mom was still living. And when, before, when she got sick, we went back. My wife and I went back. The kids were in college. Did you earn any medals in the German Army? Yes. <coughs> Tank driver's medal, hand-to-hand -hand combat medal, and wound, wound uh, purple heart, like a purple heart. It was a steel helmet medal. Yeah, three of them. I should have brought him, I didn't, but anyway, I still have him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you see, when I went to Czechoslovakia, I still had that German uniform. And we still wore the medals. You didn't, you know, the only thing you took off is that swastika. Uh, but, and then when I, before I left, I left him in Czechoslovakia. I mean, I left him at my aunt's house or uncle's house, I forgot. And then when we went to visit, I brought him back to, uh, I even brought the belt and something else back, but of course the belt is this much too, this much too small now. <laughs> um, so going on, and you have um, come home and you're wanting to go back to school. <coughs> when I went in the service, I had I didn't go to school. I took those USAFI courses, Arm, Armed Forces Institute, by correspondence, and I finished seventh grade. Oh no 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 no! In basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. They could not ship a soldier out unless he had eighth grade education. So a lot of hillbilly boys and myself, we had to go to school at night. And I finished seventh grade and I finished eighth grade. I got that uh, GED test, uh, GED diploma. I still have it. I should have brought it, I did. And then, uh, they told me I could start high school. Now that's why well, I was still in service. So I signed up for correspondence since I was going overseas. I knew I was going to Korea. And uh, I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, I was in a unit that was involved in blowing things up, picking up mines, laying mines, building bunkers for the soldiers or repairing the destroyed bunkers. So one day, and I always carried my books in my pack, in my combat pack. But one day I had an assignment. I had to leave my, uh, we had to leave our packs behind. And uh, after the attack, whatever we did, I can't, uh, it's, it's not clear anymore. My pack was gone, the artillery just right. So I wrote Yusafi in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and told him I lost my books. Could they send me new books? And they wrote back, have this signed by your company command. I need this signed by, the company com by my company commander that I lost him in combat, or I lost the books. So I did, and of course, 
the company commander marveled that I go through this. You know, I, I would work problems and stuff like that. But so when I send it back to Milwaukee, they gave me credit for those two courses that I was taking. Now, I was not honest. I lost a lot of books. And I got credit. So anyway, I wanted to stay in Korea until the armistice. By then, 1953, uh, from 52 to 53. Uh, the war was supposed to stop every day, every day, every day. Uh, so I, I thought it has to stop tomorrow or there. So I, I signed up for the duration of the Korean War until my two years were up, you know. And so the war ended, and now the, uh, I had a chance, or they asked me, to go to Japan and take the final test for for uh, the uh, course that, for the high school course. Well, I wasn't too keen because I cheated a little bit, you know, by losing books. So I wasn't really ready. But the company command, my company commander, told me, Jerry, go. You have five days and uh, the test will take one day and then you have four days uh, to wait for the results and uh, that uh, you'll have a good time so i went i came to Jap to tokyo sasebo no tokyo japan and they uh, prepared a room for me by myself and all the books and all the paper and food for the whole day and I was I was just <laughs> I knew I was not gonna pass it you know but they did tell me if you don't know the answer guess on the answer what's what's similar now I still had language problems but anyway so I did Sometimes a whole page, yes, no, yes, no, you know. At night, they came around 4.30 or so and collected everything and told me that to report back the next morning. I forgot what time it was, but anyway, I came back and they knew, uh, you know, I, I told them, I said, I didn't do all the work. And I told them what happened, you know, I lost books officially and the company commander would sign I mean, he didn't know that I didn't lose them. He signed it, I get credit for it. So anyway, all the people in that room stood up and applauded. I passed. <laughs> Low score, but I passed. I still have the scores. So anyway, I came back out of the army. I had six years of reserve in Chicago, so I uh, started, well, I came back in March and I worked uh, in, in a military thing, uh, repairing parts, just parts. and. Uh, <clears throat> I started, and people told me, the ones that I was with in the service, uh, they said, I was, uh, North Park Junior College was a religious school, and some of the guys that, were, you know, not everybody was drafted. Uh, the draft board told me, because I told them, uh, my friend and neighbors, I said, I don't have any friends yet. He says, but you're good, Kevin, for... You know what that means? Cannon footer, food for the cannons. Mm -hmm. yeah, in a Jewish neighborhood, German. So anyway, uh, I, they told me, don't go to the University of Illinois or to Loyola. 
University of Illinois will take you because they got $10,000 from the government for every student they accepted. And they accepted anybody that was had a high school diploma or a GED test. But then they flunked you out. Of course, they had their $10,000. Know. So I started with, uh, at that junior college. It was a Swedish covenant. Uh, college, North Park Junior College. It's a university now. And uh, those people were very rel religious. Now, I'm not that religious, but I was influenced by the, ki by the, by the people around us, so I went to their church. Uh, and we had church service every Wednesday, I think, or yeah, Wednesday, uh, for one hour before, after, in, in the middle, middle of the day or so. And I graduated from there. Not, you know, my grades weren't that that good, but I graduated. So then I applied to Western Illinois. Yeah, no. Yeah, West Western. Uh, anyway, I graduated from Western. But in a me, oh in, uh, no. After I graduated from North Park, I started North, uh, Northern Illinois part-time. I had a job at DeKalb, Illinois. And the rule in Illinois was if you're not a high school graduate in Illinois, you, c you cannot practice dentistry in Illinois. So I set out at Northern, went through high school in Chicago, church high school, one year, and got a diploma. Then I went back to Western Illinois, because Northern, there were, well, I shouldn't say that, there were too many people that didn't like Germans at Northern, Jewish people, you know, they, uh, they accused me that I killed their t aunts and uncles and stuff like that. So I went to Western. I got a, uh, started wanting to finish my bachelor, but I had all the requirements for dental school in 1956. But you know the draft was on, rich people didn't want to get drafted, so what did they do? Go to school. So what schools, uh, f dentists, physicians, master's degree, PhDs, so there, was, there wasn't much of a chance of getting accepted. So I finished, uh, at Western I finished a degree in teaching, teaching degree, thinking if I don't get in dental school I'll, I'll teach. And so, after I graduated from Western, I got a position in Chicago, Marshall High School. I don't know, are you familiar with yep. Marshall? Yep. It was a basketball school, all black and Latino. And as a freshman teacher, that's what you got, the bad schools, you know. But it was close to the University of Illinois. So on Fridays, we, were, we had to be out of school by 3 o'clock. So on Friday, I would stop by the University of Illinois Dental School and, you know, mingle around and, and pester them. Well, it, it probably took a year or so of pestering or so, and they finally accepted me. Mm. So this... Well, going back <coughs> to... Um, why, what was the reason that you wanted to come to the U.S.? Because <coughs> in Germany, since I couldn't finish high school, uh, couldn't finish grammar school, or couldn't finish uh, seventh grade or eighth grade, people told me uh, in the village that my mom lived, they said, you're too old and you're, you spoil our kids. So I went in an apprenticeship. The American Army had rebuilding trucks, you know, and it was run by, by the American Army, but under German supervision. 
And in my second year, second year of surgery, second, first year, all you did is me, manual work, you know, washing engines and washing the, the Germans were pulling out all those military vehicles from the forest. Nothing was manufactured except Volkswagen. And they were re rebuilding those tr cars and selling them to the American soldiers. Well, there was a little, there was a young man, and I lost contact with him. He was uh, from, da from Texas. And we were good friends. Now, he lied about his age, and he was young, I, I can't remember how old, and he joined the service. He had to be 17 at least to join the service, but he was younger than that when he joined. And we became friends. Now, <coughs> friends, I was dishonest again. He brought his car for service or do something. And in my second year, I had to work Saturday and Sunday every so often, I think once a month. So he knew it and he would come and I would work his car and didn't charge him anything. You see, so we were good friends. Now, I, I was dishonest. But I had a motorcycle and he would bring me a can of gasoline. Uh, I couldn't get any gasoline because we had a, tr a train going through to Stuttgart where I worked. So there was no excuse for them giving me ration cards for gasoline. But he would bring me a can, and I can't remember wh wh how much it was or so. So there was a mutual thing. Any anyway, he's, he, uh, sometimes food was still rationed in Germany. And sometimes he brought me stuff, uh, corned beef, and you know, and to him it was terrible, but to us, it was good. My my mom could fix it with potatoes and <coughs> and so I was telling him that I wanted to be a dentist, but I can't. Yeah, you know? and he says, "Well, you go. Why don't you go to America? You can go to school as long as you want to." So I I listened to him, and uh, I signed up to a, the, the Americans have propaganda houses, you know, they called it America House, and they told you all about this, what democracy is like and all. They were democratizing Ge Germany, you know, telling them this and this is good. So I would go, I think I worked at, till noon on Saturday as a, an apprentice, and then I would have, uh, I would go to the America house and spend all afternoon there and then walk nine kilometers or eight, six and a half miles or so back home because the train was not going there. And I signed up that I'm interested in coming, going to America. And since I was a refugee, that's what we were classified as in Germany. Uh, we probably had preference, so they gave me a number. Uh, and uh, again, I can't tell you what year it was, but it took me about four years for my number to get up, to come up. Now, I was not finished with apprenticeship, but they told me if I don't go now, it will, uh, they will get, have to give me a different number and I will have to wait again. So I quit. Mm -hmm. Came to Chicago and I had a, by then, I was, I think in the third year or third and a half year of apprenticeship. And I knew pretty much about mechanics. Uh, and I worked in a Plymouth agency in Chicago. I can't remember what the name is anymore. And of course, I had to register within 30 days with the draft board. Uh, I, I, I have the draft card someplace here. And now that was in December. In February, I had a letter 
saying my friend and neighbors uh, suggested, you know. So I went to the draft board and I, uh, oh, and the, oh, no, no, uh, that's what it was. The, uh, my boss says, this is a mistake. I showed him that I'm going to go in the army. He says, that's a mistake. You don't have to go. Uh, you're not a citizen. They can't, they can't take you. Well, it was March 25th, 26th or 27th, I can't remember. FBI picked me up from work. Took me downtown Chicago in the induction center in front of a judge. And it was seven, a penalty of so much money, I can't, 25 or $75 or 30 days in jail. So since I was only making 75 cents an hour, 75, I think, I picked the 30 days in jail. So they put me in jail at night, and the, the guard that put me in there, nothing, handcuffs or anything, this, why don't you go in the army, you know? I, and so I said, well, I, I, wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind going. My boss told me I don't have to go, because I'm not a citizen. So next morning, they uh, came, to, took me out of their cell, took me someplace, I do, some, somebody talked to me, and I said, would you go to, to the army? I said, yes. So they, that was the 28th of March or so, or 29th of March, I can't remember. Anyway, I went in and got sworn in to 31st of March in the army. Now, I was drafted. My serial number was drafted, draftee, U.S. something. Uh, but now I enlisted, so I had a different number. Uh, so now and then, they just changed mine. If you're drafted, you have a different serial number, and if you enlisted, you have a separate number now. Uh, I, I was, I retired from the reserves, but I still under the draft number. But now this year or last year, they sent me a letter and changed me to United States Army retired instead of Army of the United States, you see. So confusing anyway. Uh, Did you have any idea that when you came to the United States that you were gonna have to register? Yes, yes. You did. I had to sign that I was willing to serve. I, w I, it, it wouldn't, I, w I was going to go, but my boss said, you don't have to go, you're not a citizen. Yeah, I knew I had to go. Uh, see, in, in Germany, you could volunteer for a while for Korea as a German citizen, but they, make you, they, they give you a green card and then you go into service, but I didn't feel like I wanted to do this, you know. Uh, I wanted to go to high school, or uh, yeah, to I wanted to finish schooling, but as soon as you, uh, it was 30 days, you had to register with the draft board. So I came December 1st and I registered on time, but the boss says you don't have to go, and he was, I mean, he was sorry. <laughs> um. You were in basic training where? Fort Leonard Wood. Fort Leonard Wood. Okay. That was basic training and advanced training as I, I was trained as a combat engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, my specialty in the combat engineer thing was putting explosives into places that, need, that may have to be blown up and blowing things up. And they call them sappers. So I was a sapper. But I still was a, uh, I was in a bridge company and uh, I didn't build too many bridges. 
because I had I had to I was on a detail of picking up mines because my picking up mines was very expen uh, uh, dangerous because some of those mines were in the ground for six months or so and they were rusty and when you start fooling around with them you know we all, in the minefield we only went two soldiers at a time one on each end and the thing is some of those Minefields were not minefields. They just were labeled minefield to di to uh, distract the enemy. Because when the enemy wrote attention mine mines, he had to be as careful as if that was a real minefield. But it was not. The mine you you put up you put up a minefield to slow down the enemy. You don't stop him. You slow him down. So here you have, we put many signs in minefields, and we, they were in no our mines. But the enemy had to go looking for those mines, you know. So. Okay, doctor. Um, a question I would like to ask is, so you were sent to Korea. And where in Korea were you located at? Oh, uh, Around the third days parallel, we we had no. See, we're a bridge company is a special unit. You're always wherever they need you. Now there was uh, the Imjin River, which was by Kumwa. Then some some other little rivers, and whatever they needed. Sometimes we had to build a a gangway across a rice paddy so our tanks could drive drive over there, you know. So n no specific, no. Sp but I was with the 20, uh, the 24th engineers, uh, but uh, that discharge paper, mm -hmm. it, it tells you what unit I was with. You were with the 573rd Engineer Brigade Company? Yeah, okay. Uh, but no specific, wherever they needed us. We even supported their Marines. Now you know who the Marines are? Mm -hmm. Uncle Sam's misguided children. <laughs> That's what we called them. They were good, they were good. But sometimes they would waste 10 people to save one dead man. That didn't go for that. As a young man, I didn't. Now, if we had dead ones and we couldn't take care of them, because we let the enemy do it, yeah. And the enemy would do do, do the same. Either the civilians around there or or the enemy soldiers. <coughs> now the North Koreans were really fanatic. I mean, they were they were. <coughs> if you captured one, you know when you ca when you give up, hands up. Uh, they would put their hands like this. They had a string tied here and a hand grenade in their pocket. And when you came to search them, they would raise their hands and pull that grenade, and you get the shrapnels right from the grenade. You know what we did later on with them. They didn't put their hands up. They didn't live. That's just... The Chinese, <coughs> again, you would have to know the history. Japan invaded China in 1931, the year that I was born. Chiang Kai-shek was fighting the Japanese. Mei Zedong kept to the background. 1945, Japan surrendered. So Chiang Kai-shek had no more fighting. But Mei Zedong, who was a communist, it was supported by Russia, started fighting Chiang Kai-shek for four years. In 1949, December 1949, Chiang Kai-shek lost. The nationalists lost the war against the communists. 
So Chiang Kai-shek moved to Formosa, okay? He couldn't take all his troops from southern China with him. So Mei Zedong, who was the communist leader, put him in camps, the Chinese, those nationalist Chinese. And then he started shooting them. So the United Nations, at that time, they were pretty strong, said, hey, you can't do that. Now, that was in January, February, March of 1950. The war started in Korea, June of 1950. So Mei Zedong went to the prison, those camps and says, you're Chinese volunteers. And he sent us against our lines and we shot him for him. You see? Now the Chinese were very eager to surrender. Now every, every unit always had a political officer if that was a small unit, like a 50 men, they would have a Chinese enlisted men, communist. They called them political officers. So the China, Chinese soldier had to go forward, otherwise the, the, the political officer would shoot him, you know. And not all these Chinese soldiers had rifles, just the first, first row. And the rest, the, the ones that followed, picked up the dead man's rifles. But they were very eager to surrender. So when when you caught a Chinaman, Chinese soldier, he would raise his hands like this, you know, just to surrender. The North Korean would go like this, and then uh, while you're searching him, and you got to, some of my friends got hurt pretty bad, because all you do is when you're standing, they're shorter. The, Chinese, the North Koreans are, uh, are shorter, and you got the blast of that grenade right in this, in the vulnerable part of your body. So you got hurt pretty bad. Yeah. Now you were wounded, is yeah. that correct, in the Korean yeah. War? And um, how did you get wounded? I was on a mission. That was... Uh, Right, not too long after I got to Korea, we had to, two teams, and we pulled our names out of a box. And my name was, I pulled mine, and uh, my partner was uh, Puerto Rican. <coughs> the other team, two, two men, the other team <coughs> picked their things, and we went behind the enemy lines. The Chinamen had a tendency to dig a cave into the mountain and keep the troops in there until he had enough of them to send against us. So our orders were to seal that cave. And the only way you could seal it is by blowing the entrances in. So the, I was on the easy team, on the south team from our the North team had to go farther north into enemy territory. <coughs> the, my partner was not too enthused about this, so I had to do all the work. I was nervous, and then when we were finished, we couldn't light a match because you were uh, to uh, to start the explosive because you're in the enemy line they could see you, so we had magnetos, but the magneto only had a hundred meter wire, so you were not too far when you exploded you could still get quite a bit of debris and all this on. <coughs> anyway, we were waiting for the sh for the uh, oh when we went behind the enemy line we were at night. During the day, we observed what was going on, and then the following night, we did our work. Now, you take a guess how I had to get rid of the guard that was guarding that entrance. I couldn't shoot him. He had a rifle, so I couldn't use my special wire. I had to go on, so, you know, it's, uh, it was a human being. I still sometimes dream about it. I can still. So anyway, the, sh the flare went up, uh, given color, saying now is the time to pull the magnetos. 
While we pulled the magnetos, my side did not explode. The North team, they exploded. So the Chinese were concentrating on the North on the North side because they, they knew the enemy was was blew things up. Mine didn't explode, so they didn't know that I was there. So I went back and checked the wires, and I I did did the wrong connection. Nervous, nervous. I was very nervous, very nervous. So I corrected that, and in the meantime, Jose, my partner, kept on playing with that magneto, and I wasn't too far away from it when the explosion came. So I made it back, and now the Chinese knew we were in in that area too. Those so they started. They always fired a grenade here, and a sh sniper would fire there just to harass, just to. <coughs> so anyway, uh, we decided to separate Jose and I and go back. We were not too far from our lines, maybe 500 yards or so. But in combat, that's a long distance, you know. So we separated, and I heard that Chinese, the Chinese were good at, at discouraging you or harassing you by radio. They would put a loudspeaker close to your positions and then broadcast. Mm -hmm. Now, they would try in the rear to get a postal service, uh, a tr army truck that has uh, a mail for the soldiers. They capture those that truck, take the letters, and then they go on their radio. Hey, Private Jones, do you know your wife is screwing around with your neighbors? Now guess what Private Jones will do? He put the rifle, killed himself, killed himself because his wife is, you know, and we're all, we were all nervous, all, all the time. So anyway, Jose and I separated, and I could hear the radio, the Chinese radio broadcasting something. They were broadcasting to our unit, saying that they captured a G, uh, Yankee. So our unit knew one of us four got captured, but they didn't know which one. So they sent teams out. Now, you have to remember, we blew up that thing in the morning and we made our way while it was still dark back home, back to our unit. They couldn't find anybody. Because yeah, I was now a minefield. You now we had to cross a Chinese minefield. We couldn't look for mine. So you crawl, you know, because the, that that uh, mine is set to explode at so many pounds. So when you lay down and and crawl, you disturb it your weight. So if in case you hit a mine, you wouldn't detonate it. So I kept on crawling, and the Chi it was winter time, December 14th. Uh, the Chinese had winter uniforms on felt hats, and they didn't wear steel helmets. We wore steel helmets. So when I was crossing that minefield, now it was snowing, but I saw what appeared to be a, a helmet. Now I knew the Chinese didn't wear helmets in the winter time, so I had to be an Allied soldier. So I thought, well, let, I'll just crawl over uh, and look, and sure enough, it was a wounded GI. So uh, I had I had a, a hat on, a warm hat, so I put that just a steel helmet, not the inside on my head, and put that soldier on my, on my back. He was a young kid, 
Uh, we all weighed 110, 120 pounds. She rationed, you know, one, one day ration I could eat in one meal. And I was, <clears throat> I was going when I thought I was out of the minefield. I got up, I, I carried him on my shoulder, and I saw, now it, it was still about four o'clock or so in the morning, you see, two, three, three, three o'clock, four o'clock, because we were making our way back in the dark. And I saw a black object passing me, not too far, uh, out of the corner of the eyes. So I lay down, didn't explode. So I got up on my arm, on my hands, and looked, and in the meantime, another black object came by and a, a big fire in front of me. The explo it exploded. And of course, I, the eyes were covered with sand, you know, from that explosion. I couldn't see. <clears throat> of, of course, I couldn't hear either because that noise, that was a big bang of the mortar shell. I don't know, I can't remember what size, but we knew, you could, as a soldier, you, you knew what type of weapon was going off, whether it was yours or it was the enemy's, or, or how, bi how big it was or how small it was. So this boy was dead. Yeah, I had, I was covered with blood from him. He, he caught the shrapnels from that thing. See, I was laying down only my, so I caught it here. And that's where the artery goes to the brain. It was not cut, it was just nicked. But that artery, the carotid arteries, they support the brain and a lot of blood goes in there. I caught it in the chest, right here, uh, on the head, here, here, you know, little ones. The big ones would have killed me. It, it killed him. My mind was up. I was lo laying lower than he was, and he caught all the shrapnel. But I couldn't see sand in my eyes. Uh, the sand, it felt like when you weld with electric arc and you spark, the, uh, you get the eye burned. So you couldn't see, but you could hear. And I, I, so I started walking toward our position, or what I thought were our positions, and I got weak. This artery caused me to bleed, but I did not bleed to death because it froze and I had a lot of clothes on, so it kept on. But I was getting tired, so I sat down, rest, and of course I got delirious from lack of blood. But our medic, he was a very devoted religious uh, Seventh day Adventist. He did not believe in killing anybody, enemy or friend. And our headquarters made him carry a weapon and he did not want to carry that weapon. And he had a Geneva con convention card. If you know what that is. Yes. If you had that convention card, you cannot wear, use a weapon. Mm -hmm. But they made him, our you know, leadership was... Uh, he kept, he went out four times to look for us. Now he did, the, in the meantime, that northern team made it, Jose got captured, and but I was the only one that was missing. So he kept on going, he, they said four times he kept on looking and he finally found me. Now you have to realize it was snowing and I knew I had f snow in the face, but I couldn't raise my arm. I didn't have the strength to wipe it off. But anyway, he found me. And uh, the wounds were superficial. My, uh, well, superficial. Uh, I still have problems swallowing sometimes because when they took the shrapnel out, you know, the shrapnel must have done some damage around the inside. Uh, so now and then, 
I get things stuck in there and then I have to cough it up. Uh, the eyes, they w w uh, washed my eyes out, I think two, first four times a day and then two times a day in the, in the, hosp in the field hospital. And the doctor, the, uh, he was a Navy man, a, a, doc a Navy doctor, I, I think. Uh, he kept on asking, can you see, can you see? And the medic told me, don't tell them that you can see. Just, they'll send you back to Japan. Well, a uh, doctor came by one afternoon and he saw me doing something. So he says, oh, you can see now, huh? Next morning I was back on the front line. But I couldn't see out of the right eye just the left eye. Now that right eye is still damaged, you know, it's just, uh, uh, see, the brain, the nerves cross over. The left one goes, what happens on the left, you feel on the right. Uh, chiasma, they call it. So my main thing came from this side, but the damage was, yeah. Uh, of course, hearing, you know, uh, I can hear uh, without the hearing aids, but the older I get, the worse it started to get, you know, and my wife's voice goes down. She, more and more like this, and, and uh, so I have to wear those <coughs> hearing aids more often. But that is how, that is how I, how I got hurt. Yeah. And I was not in that field hospital. I don't think I was there three weeks and I was back online. Mm -hmm. Because you have to realize, tomorrow the war stops. So the United States did not send more replacements. Mm -hmm. So they, they were short. We had Korean, South Koreans in our units. So anybody they could spare, they would. They even sent cooks out on patrol. You know, so this is why that doctor was anxious or had to get me back to the unit. You know, not that the unit missed me, but uh, what I did, any any one of them, almost any one of them in the unit could do, except mix up those wires <laughs> or that. Anyway. Now you. Uh You received some medals, uh -huh. and um, were they all after the Korean War, or were some of them In the after reserve, after you? Uh, no, uh, some of them were during the Korean War, <laughs> and I can't tell you which one. See, I, I, I was not, I mean, I was dedicated, don't get me wrong, but medals didn't mean anything, it was just a bother. but. Uh, when before that interview that my uh, grandson had, uh, he asked me, w "What medals you had?" I, said, I don't know. So I uh, called uh, at St. Louis place or wrote wrote them, and then they uh, see they they have uh, I uh, you have to realize. We came back, and we were treated like dirt. When we got off the boat, they put us on a train, and we went to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Nobody, you know, no uh, thank you for, for your service or whatever. This is because the American people were tired of the, of the war. That was right after the Second World War, and they realized we had no business there. You know. Do you think we have business in Afghanistan? Or uh, no, we supported Norega when he was fighting the Iranians for eight years, and all of a sudden he's a bad guy, and he t took all those troublemakers in check. Look what's happening there now. Everybody's killing everybody. It's a religious thing, a fanati fanatism. Fan well, <laughs> fanatics, you know. One sect is fighting the other. And uh, he, he 
took care of him. He kept him in line. Mm -hmm. And we supported him. We gave him tanks, money, you know, you know. All of a sudden he's bad. Do you, um, did you have difficult, a difficult time adjusting from being in the German army and then shortly thereafter uh -huh. being in the American army? No, no. The American army was, e well, basic training was hard in the American army because I must have had a special basic training in the German army because they wanted to get the troops in. So basic training was, we had at, at Fort Leonard Wood, a lot of it, uh, boys were discharged because they couldn't take it. Now, no, I had no, well, don't get me wrong. I was tired, I was hungry because they had this crap. Uh, 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 they only gave you so much a day. Uh, you couldn't go to a PX or anything, the, at least the first eight weeks, because you were restricted to the area, so you couldn't buy anything, you know. But then the second, the second eight weeks, I took 16 weeks. Uh, uh, it was it was easier, you know. But the first eight weeks, you had to do so many pull-ups. If you didn't make the pull-ups, you had to get out of line. You couldn't go for food. thinking r was wrong, you know, the thinking was wrong. Did you, when you were in Korea, or when you were in the service in the United States Army, did you communicate with your folks? With oh your, yeah, oh you yeah. Did? Uh, I have samples. This is, now this is a, this is a guy in Germany. I send them the letter And he would give it to my mom. See? In, I wrote in German because I, I, I didn't write English. Now I must have sent this, I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> you see? But. Because we were close to Stuttgart, and there Stuttgart had a lot of American soldiers. Uh, my brother would go and pick up the letter. And of course, uh, my mom, now that was after oh, rations stopped. You, you could buy us, must have made some meals or so. And then he went home, and then there was another uh, this was an of, a warrant officer, an officer mm -hmm. that my brother knew, and he would. And those letters, and there was another one. You see, now you realize that we didn't have to pay any postage. <laughs> anyway, yes, I communicated. I uh, uh, now let me let me read you something. I'll interpret it for you. Uh, Happy New Year. So that must have been 1952. Uh, now they did, they did give us, or made sure, we had a man, um, a postman soldier mm -hmm. bringing the mail, and he would also give you uh, envelopes and stuff like that. Uh, but I, I just want to... Uh, I don't know if that's... Uh, now that was, here is the date, I, I don't know why, mm -hmm. but it, you know, I wrote in German. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm looking for something. Uh, anyway, yes, I, I stayed. Now, through the American Postal Service, Military Postal Service, 
it only took a week or two. Otherwise, if you send it to the states, through the civilian, it would go through the civilian side, first through the Japanese, and it took year, uh, weeks. I, I can't find it now, anyway. You said that when you came home, that the welcoming was not very good. No. And you didn't have any friends, nor you said. Yeah. And you didn't have any family. Well, I had friends where I worked. You know, they, they, they welcomed me. No, so, but so I mean, I mean, as a unit, as mm -hmm. as as coming back as combat veterans, like now, you know, they uh, blow the horn and and uh, welcome. We didn't have it. We got off the boat, in trains and off. It was, and it took us a week to go from. Uh, Pittsburgh, California, off the boat to Fort Sheridan, a week or something in uh, regular troop, tr regular train, hard benches and stuff like that. Now, <clears throat> when you came back and located in Chicago again, did uh, did you join the reserves then? Well, I was in the reserves. You automatically was in the reserves. Well, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's see. I, I have. I have this to the. To okay. So that was right after you got out, and there. Well, thirty days they right. gave you. Or right. So. Uh, and since I lived within, <coughs> now it says you can join a unit, organized unit, you see. Otherwise, you just had to go, uh, I forgot now what, uh, to meetings so, so whenever they wrote you a letter. Uh, and you made friends in the reserves. I stayed all six years because, you know, you may, we lied to each other how... <laughs> How tough we had it, and all you know how GIs are, or men are. They brag a lot. Well, we were one. Uh, let me tell you, oh, I I remember one uh, young man. He was I looked after him because he was small. Now he was old, but he was small, and we were. When we got off the boat in from from the replacement depot in Korea, now we had to march uh, go by night because uh, airplanes or observers, enemy observers, could see it. So we came on the crossroad, and there was uh, somebody standing there. I can't remember if he was an officer or a sergeant. He says, "Anybody can type, can type," and. Of course, I, I didn't even answer because I couldn't type. And, but Schoffelberger, the guy that I was looking for, raised his hand. He didn't even finish grammar school. But anyway, it took him, and he stayed. I met him in Japan again, and he stayed in that, jo in that typing job. Apparently, they felt he was a likable, like a young kid, likable guy. He, he, he spent his time in headquarters. Yeah, so. <clears throat> when did you retire from the reserves? Uh, How old were you? How many years ago? Oh, I was going for general. So I could stay over 60. Now, I was... Uh, let's see. Uh, I retired the 10th day of December of uh, 93. Uh, 
Okay. Now, I was eligible to retire. This is to notify you you have completed your required years of service and you will be eligible to retire for retirement pay. Eight, 1986. So I stayed seven more years. I didn't have to. But, like, uh, there was a there was a purpose. Now, I didn't believe in the Vietnam War because the way Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, uh, the French lost the French Indochina War in uh, 1954. The guy on the north of Vietnam and the guy on the South Vietnam, they were rivals, but they were the same government. So the North f was fighting the French. I don't know if you recall Dien Bien Phu, where the French capitulated. So the North took over. The, Viet uh, the uh, South government fled, and they were asking President Eisenhower to send troops, help them. And President Eisenhower says, you don't need our help. You're a free country now. The French are out of the country, and you don't need our help. Well, I think he did send some advisors, I don't know. But then President Kennedy was elected. Again, the South Vietnamese asked for help, and Kennedy gave him advisors and support. The President Kennedy got assassinated. Am I being photographed? President Johnson, I didn't like him, and I don't think he was an honest man, saying the North Vietnamese attacked our ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. And he sent the 1st Infantry Division in the, into South Vietnam, the 1st Cavalry Division, the 4th Infantry, and 56,000 men later, we left. Accomplished nothing. 200 and some maimed, 200,000 maimed soldiers, 56,000 dead soldiers. I didn't believe in that war. Neither do, did I believe in Afghanistan. And, uh, but that's just, who am I, you know? So, now what was your question? I, I forgot. Um, well, you answered it. Yeah, what? I ask, I ask um, what year you retired. Oh, 19, December 10th, mm -hmm. 1993. And you said you were trying to become a general. Yes. That's why I was able to stay beyond, I, my rank was colonel. Mm -hmm. You can stay up to age 60. But because I was going for a promotion, they retained me until the board we were four men going for assistant uh, surgeon general reserves one was a very religious man out of Pennsylvania a colonel there was a lady a black lady, a nurse, that was, she was a colonel. Then there was a oral surgeon from Dallas, Texas, and myself. Well, it took two or, or three years to go through the process. So in the meantime, I became, in, in 93, I was, what, 62? So. <coughs> and the lady was eliminated someplace along the line. Then uh, another guy was eliminated. We were two, three remaining, three remaining. The religious man, the guy from San Antonio, and my, uh, from Dallas and myself. So the final interview was in St. Louis. I shouldn't be talking about it, but anyway, I will. 
you need now I made it up to Colonel why I don't know I had a good combat record I did not uh, no punishment or anything so you know now you don't make Colonel just like this it's, it's just <coughs> so anyway that religious man now I don't know whether, uh, why he was so religious and I can't remember what religion but every time we ate we had to pray Every time we went someplace, even in a restaurant, we prayed. Uh, I didn't like it. Uh, so we went for a final interview, final elimination interview. He went first. And two of us, that sur oral surgeon and myself, were in, in uh, some, you know, like a waiting area. The door was open in that, and there were a couple of colonels, a couple of generals sitting there. And all of a sudden, we heard him pray. And I said, I thought to myself, this is the end of that guy. <coughs> he had that whole board pray for him, I guess. <laughs> so I came next. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not an atheist, uh, but I'm not a showman. Next I came, and, uh, you know, the questions to ask, is, is it uh, a good rapport or whatever that, that was. And then the last question they asked me was, do you be uh, belong in fraternal organizations? Well, I belonged to the Reserve Officers Association. I belonged to uh, Illinois State Dental Society. I belonged to the National Society of No Electricity. <laughs> We're fine. And uh, dental, then I became the County Dental, dental Society the Purple Heart thing, and everybody wants a little money. So I said, no, not I, ha I belong to enough uh, organization, and I do, do not consider joining any. He said, I have one, and I forgot his rank. I can still see him asking the question. Have you ever considered masonry? Freemasonry, and I said, no, sir, I'm a Catholic by birth, and we're not allowed Freemasonry. And all of a sudden, I look, and every one of them had a masonry on, and I knew. So anyway, <coughs> the guy from Texas, he, he liked me. He was a very handsome guy. A little bald is it, but he had his as long as his hair was as long as the army would permit. And in every place we went, he would never let me pay because he knew I practiced in a state institution and what my pay. I must have told him what my pay was. He called me and congratulated me. I said, well, I haven't heard. He said, well, you must have been selected because I just received a letter that I was not selected. Mm. Three months later, I get the letter that I was not selected. And this was, this was the kind of, they, very, they stick together. Now, let me tell you how, what I consider. Uh, uh, academy graduate, if you have, they're probably the worst officers that you can get. Maybe they stick together and all they want is promotions and medals. A soldier that was came from the rank, became an officer through officer training, it was bad because whatever he had to do as an enlisted man he made you do now and when you complain that this is not right he says that's how what i had to do the best officers that i found was reserve officer training corps soldiers officers that went through rotc 
they had, first of all, a little brain, sense, and I like them. They, they, I, I can't recall any bad order, but from the OCS guys, oh, it was, ter it was terrible. But anyway, this is how, I, oh, and as soon as I got that letter, now that letter must have, since I got retired October 10th, it must have been July or so when I got that letter that I have not been selected. So, because three or thereabouts, I was the discharge. Uh, now, no, it must have been earlier because I put in for, for I knew I couldn't stay. So I put in to, for retirement July 4th, 1993, and I was retired. So I still went to summer camp. I had it out with a brigadier general. He wanted our unit to run in 90 degree weather. We had to run four miles at that time. That was the rule. And I argued, I said, our men will not run in this heat. Well, you wake them up at night. And I said, that's when they're resting. We're doing, we were dental, a dental unit. Uh, so I had an argument with him. He uh, uh, he was a, a colonel. He was a colonel. He was a lieutenant colonel, or colonel, and he lived 15 miles away from the base. It was in San Antonio, I think. And he ran to work, and he ran to home again. He did it every day, but there was nothing here. So he turned me over to the. Uh, medical commander, uh, brigadier general, and th I just told him. I said, "This is this is how, how I feel about it." Uh, to me, a brigadier general, knowing how they select officers, uh, general officers, not uh, up to colonel, you can, but general. You know, I told you about this. Uh, I must have talked back to him. I, uh, I uh, disregarded uh, his comments. So I got a meritorium that I have to go back to drill. So I said, oh, what's going to happen now is I'm going to get court-martialed and demoted. The reason they called me back from uh, to get the drills, they wanted to pay me $9,000 for my services. You know, I guess that's a severance pay. Uh, while I was serving, I got the retirement pay plus the drill pay. So when I retired, somebody found out I got I was a double dipper, <laughs> and they wanted me to, and I didn't use the money. Once I got when when I got the notice, I put it in the bank. I mean, I didn't touch it. Uh, so <coughs> when uh, they finally somebody found out that, that I got both pays, they made me pay it back. They gave me a choice. I think I owed nine thousand dollars. They gave me a choice of paying the whole thing or twenty-five dollars a month, and I must have been ordinary. I selected twenty-five dollars a month paying $9,000 back. So for a year, every time I, uh, it, uh, uh, it took that $25 out of, out of my retirement pay. And after about a year, they forgave me. <laughs> I felt dirty, but that's, that was not my intention. But it just, uh, well, what I objected to why, I didn't know why they put a moratorium on my retirement. And that was because they uh, oh, uh, they felt I should receive so much money. You know, anyway. Well, Doctor, at this time, <clears throat> I would like to thank you for sharing your story with me. Well, I'm good at it. And <laughs> it was very interesting. Well, when I look back at it, the only thing that I, what amazed me, that I'm still alive. Now, let me tell you a little combat story. 
I was in a comedy engineer unit, but I was sort of a specialist at demolition. Now, <coughs> being a foreigner, an immigrant, I sometimes got bad assignments. Now, I drew my name out of a box for the assignment, but I'm sure that whoever put those names in there made dozens of my names in there, because I always drew, anyway, I drew <coughs> to go on a combat mission with a flamethrower. You know what a flamethrower is? You burn, so you go in, you, jelly, gasoline, we mix, uh, what was it now? I can't remember. Anyway, and you carry five gallons of high flammable stuff and you shoot it into bunkers or sometimes on soldiers too. So, and as a flamethrower man on that, pat on that combat patrol, I had to be first. Now there was a guy ahead of me yet who was point, they called it an appointment, but I was right after the appointment. So we come into that area and I see a hole in the, in the hill Korea was nothing but hills. Uh, so I said, oh, I'll just squirt a little, maybe a, a quarter or two in, in there. And when I did this, now this five gallons is heavy on your back, you know. It splashes too. It throws you off. You have to be very careful. And that pipe that you're carrying, the, th the thrower, is awkward. I had a handgun in my side, but I needed both hands for that torch. Two guys come, come running out of that hole that I've burned. One was burning, and the other one ran away from me. The guy that was burning ran toward me, and I froze. He held his little uh, burp gun, his machine gun, his little automatic weapon against me, and in those few seconds that I faced them, I said goodbye to my mom, I said goodbye to my brother, I said goodbye to both of my sisters. And his gun did not go off. Now, again, I feel bad about it because I turned around and let him have it. Now I realize he had a mother and he had a father and he may have been married, I don't know. Okay, that was in Korea. In uh, Russia, that's, I faced death twice. In Russia, we were, every morning you had to stand in line and a guy, a so Russian soldier, now whenever the Russian soldier was killed in the prisoner war camp, and they were killed, there was some SS, they were really fanatic. The war stopped. Yeah, May 8th, but in September or October, the German army was still in the forest, shooting, fighting. But they would go into the prisoner of war camp, or maybe if they got captured, and then they would shoot us, a, a Russian soldier. For every Russian soldier, the Russian army killed 10 soldiers. Now, the way they would select them, one guy would go with a paint bucket, with the paint, and when you were standing in line, just and he came to me, looked at me, and moved to the next guy. <laughs> that was the first time that I came this close. Yeah. So, anyway. <coughs> well, I would like to also thank you at this time for serving our country. Um, for serving our country. Oh. Um, I, you, I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate well, your time. I'll, but the thing is, now I shouldn't be talking about it. You see, I don't believe in wars. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be an American. If I had screwed up, they would have sent me back to Europe. Because I signed that I will serve. So anyway, uh, I want to show you 